We have the same problems everybody else has in the same proportion. We have major, major issues in the same proportion, but on an individual level. There is a weak narration, but it's strong in its meaning that if a person taunts someone else who's committing a sin, they will not die until they commit that same sin. And we have a tendency to see other people falling into deep holes and at some point in our lives thinking that will never be us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows man has been created weak and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows as well that when we put ourselves in proximity to trouble, then we end up dulling our senses and our better selves and ending up in things that we previously would have thought were unthinkable. We would never become. You start off a relationship, you justify one thing, then you say, well, I've already gone this far, I might as well take this next step. Well, you know, it's bound to end up here, let me just go this far. You start going down paths, and that's why the emphasis is on proximity. Don't come close to zina. It is a wicked, or it's, it's a, a shameless sin, it's a dark path. Once you get on that path, you won't know how to turn around at times, you'll just feel stuck, and you'll keep sinking further and further into that sin. I want us to think about it from a much deeper level. Have you ever committed a sin that gave you long-term happiness? Have you ever done something that was disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something that you really knew that you shouldn't have been doing, but you thought that if you got into it, that it would bring you happiness and it actually brought you happiness. How many people that actually turn their backs on divine guidance and actually take those dark paths end up finding what they are looking for? The answer is most likely close to zero. There are very few people that actually go down that path and actually find fulfillment. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is not why are we committing those sins or those particular sins being specific to those sins or specific to those behaviors, but what void did I have inside that led me to that? And I want you to contrast, I want you to think right now, and this is actually a thinking session for yourselves and me. Take a moment, 10 seconds. Think about something that you did in life, a good deed that you did, that really made you feel fulfilled. Keep that good deed in your head. Think about a sin that you committed that caused you regret. Compare how you felt after that good deed as opposed to how you felt after that sin. And Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that every sin that you commit is a temporary pleasure followed by a lifetime of regret. Whereas every good deed that you do is a short, is, is a short time, a fleeting moment of struggle followed by a lifetime of joy. The fulfillment that you feel when you do something good. Now what good is and what bad is, those are specifics. But when you do something good, the level of fulfillment that you have knowing that you struggled for something that was worth it, that in the process, hopefully you earned the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you became that much closer to living up to the potential that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you. That fulfillment of actually restricting yourself, finding the willpower and the self-determination to restrict yourself from things that you didn't wait for someone else to step in and get you, but you yourself, caught yourself and said, you know what? This is not the type of person that I want to be. If you see yourself committing the good deed, you might move beyond a phase of encouragement and feeling content with what you're doing to a stage of arrogance and being conceited. So keep your eyes on the hasana itself. Keep your eyes on the good deed itself. Don't see yourself doing it because shaitan would much rather that you take pride in your good deeds and hence reach a station of pride and arrogance and become judgmental and deluded by what you deem good, shaitan would much rather that than a person that is falling behind and knows that they're falling behind and wants to get better and is making some sort of effort to get better. So see the good deed, don't see yourself committing the good deed. But when it comes to sin, see yourself committing the sin, don't look at the sin itself. What does that mean? If you take a step back, and you think of yourself committing that sin and you look at it and you say, how do I look right now? Is that the person that I envision myself becoming? Saying that, doing that, being that person. And if you take a deep look at that and then you realize that's not who I wanted to be. That's not what I'm capable of. And don't look at the sin itself because the sin can be decorated and beautified. But you know what? That's not what I wanted to be. 
And here's what shaitan tries to get you to do. In a temporary moment of ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the temporary moment of heedlessness, he wants you to do something so stupid that you'll feel like you can never recover from it. So while you're at it, mess up as much as you can. So in that temporary moment of heedlessness, you do something that's permanently damaging so that you can't come back. Or at least you feel like you can't come back. So it started off with a little thing, but you know what? Why don't you, you know, ink it in a little bit? Why don't you get a few tattoos while you're at it? Why don't you, why don't you get, a, you know, get yourself in some trouble so you have a, a criminal record? He distances you so far so that when you wake up to your senses, you're like, I can't come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tries to sink you in your moment of heedlessness. And when you feel that distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel like you can't come back. You feel like you're never going to be able to approach Him again. And you forget all of those ahadith. The man who was a serial killer, who turned back to Allah and was forgiven. You forget that Allah is approachable. Because shaitan takes you from a healthy feeling of regret to a feeling of absolute despair. Your Lord is approachable. Allah is approachable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how He created you. And He loves you enough that when He sees you even in your most broken and vulnerable state, if you express any sense of sincerity and a desire to return, not only will He allow you to return, He'll show you exactly how to get back to Him. He doesn't shut those doors on you. And there are people that come to that realization and because of that, not only, not only do they get themselves out of the darkness, but they find meaning and purpose in why they were in that darkness in the first place so that they can help guide other people out of it. They don't become judgmental. They don't become arrogant. They don't become self-deluded. They become self-aware. And when you're self-aware, then you're able to guard from falling into that path again and you don't put down people that are on that path right now. But a person becomes self-aware and is willing to restrict themselves because of that self-awareness from things that they know are no longer good for them. That void that you have on the inside, what is it that leads a person to sin? Seeking pleasure. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for you, you won't, be, you won't go searching for solutions outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your problems and to what you feel like is not your happiness. Isn't Allah enough for His servants? They said the only one who goes looking for solutions from shaitan is the one for whom Allah is not enough. When Allah is enough for you, then you don't go looking for that stuff. And when you compare the contentments of a believer that is connected to Allah, connected to their purpose, self-aware, you will never find that type of fulfillment and contentment elsewhere. It's impossible. That type of fulfillment cannot be found anywhere else. But you've got to address the void. And you've got to look to it. Why do I look for happiness outside of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to me? Why is it that so many people are willing to come from a free environment where everything is at their access and give it all up for Allah and fight, fight off all sorts of pressure from their family, from their friends, from their circle because they know that this is where happiness lies. When you know why you're here, and not only do you know why you're here, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in accordance with why you're here. And you know who you want to please and who you want to meet on the day of judgment while he is pleased with you. You're able to move past that. It sounds fluffy. It's not fluff. It's not a game. It's not this idealistic notion of spirituality and being fulfilled. It's real. The more you forget Him, the more you forget yourself and you forget why you're here. The more you know Him, the more you know yourself and know why you're here. And that knowledge of self is an incredible asset to be able to take on anything that's going to come your way. It's an amazing state of being to have. And it's not something that you get and then you have for the rest of your life. It's something that you get and that you have to keep on uh, increasing so that you don't lose it after you get there because a lot of people do. If you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a contractual basis, a halal haram basis, and everything is a technicality to you, and every haram you're going to try to halalify with some fatwa that you're going to find out of nowhere, pull out of some obscure website on the internet, you might numb yourself to be able to enjoy that moment of heedlessness, but you're not filling any void. You're not peeling any layers. You're not actually learning how fulfilling it is to liberate yourself by putting yourself in that servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a game, it's real.
There are athletes, superstars, celebrities, people that could have had everything of this world, but decided that that's where they want to be. When you stand on the Day of Judgment, don't think about the people that are going to be standing that are doing worse than you. And this is, I think, one of the greatest problems we have with the exposure to so much that normalizes those unthinkable sins to us. Well, these people do it, that person does it, so it's not that big of a deal if I do it as well. When you think of yourself standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, don't think about people that are less than you. Allah knows if they're actually less than you or not, but people that are doing those things, standing there with you. Realize that on the Day of Judgment, when you stand before Allah, you will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the same day that Abu Bakr will be standing before Allah and Khadija will be standing before Allah. And great people will also be questioned by Allah on that same day. So with all the garbage that gets unearthed and all of the things that get normalized online through the cancer of social media, that cannot become your world. If that becomes your world, you will truly lose yourself. But you've got to be able to have that pulse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you get that time to actually think, where you actually participate in real things, where you're actually doing stuff. Going out there and doing something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and connecting to your purpose. You find yourself, you find your purpose, and it doesn't matter what's normalized at that point, it's not normal for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to come into complete harmony with that purpose and find fulfillment in that which is pleasing to Him. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from falling to our lower selves in our temporary states of heedlessness and not finding a way back to Him. Allahumma ameen. Your support can help us continue to educate and motivate people to make and publish videos daily. Jazakallah.